presentation here for May 2011. I'm Lauren McLean of the McLean Family Law Group. Uh, I've been practicing 28 years. We have three offices. Uh, there's not a family case, as I said, that I probably haven't already done about 10 times. And one of the most disturbing is uh, cases involving child custody and parental alienation. And so we have a continuum in these type of cases from, at one end, alienation where it is the custodial parent or the primary parent that's causing the problem, uh, to sort of a middle ground where there may be just a natural alliance of the children with, with one of the parents, and then all the way to the other end where we call it estrangement, and that is inappropriate actions by the access or non-custodial parent that actually causes the problem. So let's go first to the definition of parental alienation. Uh, Robert Gardner was one of the first people to come up with a definition. He called it a syndrome, and many of the experts uh, don't believe that syndrome is appropriate. So the more modern phrase used with respect to this situation is just parental alienation. Uh, you have experts that don't believe it exists at all. You have experts that believe it exists uh, in many cases. and. Uh, there is even disagreement over the definition. And so while they can't necessarily agree on whether it's a syndrome or what the exact definition is, they all agree that something in terms of alienating children from parents uh, does occur. All right? So there's, there's broad based support for the concept that in high conflict cases, something like alienation is occurring. The exact definition, whether it's a syndrome, whether it should be on the DSM-5, which some psychiatrists are calling for now, is still hotly debated. So PA, I'll call it, is a disorder that arises primarily in the context of child custody disputes. Its primary manifestation is the child's campaign of denigration against a parent. And the key factor is that it has no justification. If there's a reason for the child disliking the parent, we call that estrangement. But if it's frivolous or weak, or you hear uh, adult language being used that you know clearly is not from your child, then you may have a problem with it. It results from a combination of programming or brainwashing by the primary parent who's trying to indoctrinate the child, and uh, at a stage, the child's own contributions to the vilification of the target parent. So children uh, in high conflict cases are trying to survive. They are trying to please both their parents. It's not uncommon for them to say, one thing to one parent and the exact opposite to the other. And so you'll see that in affidavits when you come to court. One father, the father saying, the child wants to live with me. The mother saying, no, he wants to live with me. And the problem is that that child knows what the parents want to hear, does not want to lose a healthy bond with both parents, so is in this dangerous sort of high wire act of trying to keep both parents happy. It's not that they're lying to one or the other, it's they just want to please their parents. But when it goes beyond that, and they begin to choose one side to survive, often what they perceive to be the weaker parent, for example, or a parent who may have some psychiatric issues that that child feels they have to take over the parenting of, um, that's when it really gets going. So we can move on to the next slide, please. Denigration. That's where the parent uh, is bad-mouthed by the child uh, in the presence of the alienating parent. So they may express profuse hatred. Uh, they learn that by denigrating the other parent, that they'll be pleasing the custodial parent. And so they're actually responding to that parent and trying to please them. But it takes a toll on the child, obviously, playing that game. Next slide, please. Deprecation. They'll base the negative statements about the parent on weak or frivolous uh, rationalizations. Uh, and what will happen is then the alienating parent will grab the child's statements and use that as proof of this parent's inadequacy. So it's this circular thing that spurs it on from the child and from the parent. Next slide, please. Lack of ambivalence. So what happens is, uh, unlike in sort of an intact family where the child would show some guilt uh, or remorse for being mean to a parent, uh, what happens in the alienated child's mind is they begin to have no uh, compunction about doing it. So they see the alienated parent as the white knight, they see the deprecated parent as, as the bad guy. Uh, the rejected parent is perceived as having only negative qualities. And so that happens 
you know, it, it happens in a milder sense as well with parents. So when they get married, they see the strengths and, and weaknesses in their partner. And overall, they, they marry that partner because they, they think there's a net positive there. Unfortunately, at the end of a marriage, the positives are pretty much ignored by each of the spouses and they focus only on the negative. So, for example, uh, if the um, borderline personality uh, percentage of the population is somewhere around 3%, in my practice, if I listen to my clients, it would be closer to 100% uh, of the ex-spouses. If I listen to uh, my, my clients about alcoholism, just about everyone would be an alcoholic and things of that nature. So, what happens is, to a greater extent, it can get worse if it starts to involve the child because it's, it's one thing to have the two parents not being that positive about each other, but most parents are able to sort of bury the hatchet in front of the child and not draw the child into it. So when we get to the alienated stage, the alienated parent is perceived only as negative, okay? And even previously positive events of that parent with the child are also perceived as negative. Next slide, please. Independent thinker. All right, so you will hear a child in this case say, and don't say mom came up with this, it's my own idea. So you'll start to hear a lot of phrases as if the child's saying it's all me because they don't want to get the other parent in trouble, they don't perceive that the other parent could be in any way bad, so they will say that it's all their own idea. Uh, and then on top of that, you'll get the alienated parent saying, it's the child's choice. I have to respect what the child wants. I'm not doing it. I'm just listening to little Johnny, okay? Next, please. The child will automatically and reflexively support the alienating parent. So it's just like, mom's right, or dad's always right, access parent, you're always wrong. Whenever there's a choice to be made, the child will always go with one parent over the other. Next, please. Six, absence of guilt over the cruelty to the alienated parent, no feelings of guilt, over their behavior towards that parent at all, and the child's behavior is clearly related to brainwashing and programming by the alienated parent. Sorry, alienating parent. Absence of guilt again, they, uh, oh, sorry, it almost looks like the same slide. There you go. Presence of borrowed scenarios. So the children will use language and expressions that are clearly not their own. They'll use words that are not age appropriate for them. They will create scenarios that you know that child was never involved in. And so you begin to see that it's, it's, it's coming from, uh, from the parent. You'll get two children, for example, being interviewed separately by the psychologist that will have an exact identical story of an event. All right? that, that psychologist that's trained in the area knows couldn't possibly have happened. Okay? So you'll hear exact sort of recreations of an event uh, from all of the children. Next. The last uh, of the eight symptoms of PA is animosity projected onto friends and extended family. So I talked about it not being uh, gender biased. So it's not just against men, it's against women too, and it's against the extended family members. So aunts will become bad, grandmothers are bad, granddads are bad, an entire one side of the family will turn out to be bad, okay? That's a, another huge warning sign when they're excluded. Gifts will be returned, phone calls, uh, there will be no calls on birthdays, Mother's Days, etc. Next, please. All right, so we talked first about alienation. We went through all those factors, okay? And, and that's at the one end of the continuum, as I said, you know. At the other end is estrangement. Children are estranged, so it means they don't want contact with the other parent, not because they're being brainwashed, not because they're being fed false scenarios, but because of moderate to severe parenting deficiencies by the non-custodial parent. So, persistent, immature, and self-centered behaviors, where a parent can't put the child's best interest ahead of his own or her own. Chronic emotional abuse of the child or preferred parent. So, uh, perhaps the non-custodial parent does nothing but badmouth the custodial parent on an access visit. And when they attack that parent, they're really, in fact, attacking the child, right? Because that child comes from both parents. Uh, physical abuse that goes undetected, uh, categorically angry, rigid, and restrictive parenting styles, and psychiatric disturbance or substance abuse. So you've got mom or dad who shows up at the door drunk, or drinks when they have the, the children over, or lets the children go unsupervised, all right? 
Uh, and so it can be as little as moderate, all the way up obviously to, uh, to gross uh, parenting incapacity. And so that comes from Kelly and Johnson. Uh, these two authors are more on the side of not seeing parental alienation in all but the rarest of cases. Gardner, more on the side of seeing it in many of the cases, all right? And so that's what I say when I talk about a dispute between the various experts. Next, please. Enmeshment. This is another one of the factors that's really interesting. In enmeshment, the family members are over-involved with one another and over-responsive, okay? So the boundaries become diffuse. Uh, the family members intrude on each other's thoughts, feelings, and communication. So what happens is the children aren't children anymore. They become peers of the parent, all right? Or they, in, in the most severe cases, begin to actually take over the role of parenting the parent. And it's extremely damaging to children because they need to develop normally, and if you make them become adults too soon, uh, it's very unhealthy. Uh, boundaries are diffuse, it results in a confusion of roles, and, and the individuals or the children's autonomy becomes severely restricted. Next slide, please. Parentification. This is a case where there's a functional or emotional role reversal. So the child takes over, sacrifices their own needs to look after the needs of the parent. And so perhaps the parent is not bad-mouthing the other parent, but says, you can go see your mother if you want. I'll be okay. All right, so the dad does things like that. The child's like, what's dad going to do if I leave him? I don't trust dad to be left on his own. What's he going to do to himself? So that child's like, I, I can't go see mom. I got to stay with my dad because who knows what dad's going to do if I leave him alone, all right? Parentification, treating the dad or the mom as a toddler that can't be left alone because something bad's going to happen. They learn to readily respond to their, their parents' needs. Obviously, the child is, is very empathetic. It becomes problematic when there's a lack of acknowledgement and reciprocity between the adults and children in terms of nurturing exchange, or when the expectations or emotions exceed the child's abilities. And so what happens is the child ends up being damaged by that, and the child's needs are ignored. Uh, basically, the child puts their own best interests, sorry, the, parent puts their own best interest over that of the child, and that's not good. Next. Warshak was another uh, author that came uh, out with a definition of parental alienation. He calls it a disturbance whose primary manifestation is a child's unjustified campaign of denigration against or rejection of one parent due to the influence of the other parent combined with the child's own contribution. So you've got that circular sort of feeding of the problem. Next. He says there's three essential elements of parental alienation. The rejection or denigration that reaches the level of a campaign, all right? So you could have a child that's upset because they got sent to their room and so they said, I hate you, Dad, okay, or I hate you, Mom. But it doesn't persist for months or years. It's a, it's a one-off. It's not justified and it's a partial result of the non-alienated parent's influence. And so what Warshak says, if any of these three elements is absent, then it's not going to be parental alienation. All right, next please. Dr. Michael Bone is a, uh, he's come up with a more current definition. Again, what he says here is the important concept is that each parent is given the responsibility to promote a positive relationship of the child with the other parent. He looked for access and contact blocking, all right? So we have this concept of gatekeeper that's in very in vogue right now where there are excuses, excuses given as to why the child is not available, uh, whether the child doesn't want to go, we're busy, you didn't give me enough notice, uh, you're five minutes late, tough luck, all of those factors. Next, please. Unfounded abuse allegations, something uh, like your case, Michael, all right? Uh, that's a common one of the criteria. Next, deterioration in the relationships and separation. So if a parent is clearly trying to maintain a positive relationship with the children through visitation and other activities and the children don't want to see him or her, 
the alienation process may be in operation. And this is a key factor here. Children do not naturally lose interest in and become distant from their non-residential parents simply by virtue of the absence of that parent. It's not normal for the child because of the absence to not want to see that parent anymore. Okay, that's, that's a real key indicator. Next, please. Intense fear reaction by the child. An obvious fear reaction on the part of the child of displeasing or disagreeing with the alienating parent, all right? Child learns to please that parent. Child learns to fear uh, letting that parent down. And the children are put in a position of being the alienating parent's agent, and they face various loyalty tests. So, you want to go see your father? Really? You know, and they, you're basically a, a traitor to me if you want to go see your father. How, how dare you? You know what he did to me. You know what he did to us. That type of mentality. Next, please. The key point from Bohm's criteria is that the alienating parent forces the child to choose parents, and it's in direct opposition to a child's